Um, and now we're going to shift to what does the future look like? So to start off, uh, Jennifer. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for, for having me here today. I'm Jennifer. I'm an epidemiologist at UC Berkeley. And I'm really excited to talk about some of the work that Gail alluded to, which is born out of a partnership between UC Berkeley and the California Department of Public Health. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit about the effects of precipitation, heat, and drought on incidents in the state, and hopefully getting a little bit into some of our field work, which ties well into what Dr. Taylor talked about earlier this morning. Um, so as Gail mentioned, we know that in California, the burden of incidence is highest in the lower San Joaquin Valley, um, particularly counties like Kern and Kings. And these are the counties that have historically been the hottest and the driest. Um, as Gail also mentioned, we've seen increases in valley fever across the entire state, including in these very endemic counties like Kern, um, where there's been an over eight-fold increase in incidence between 2000 and 2018. However, if we look at the regions that fall outside the historically very endemic areas, we're seeing even greater increases, um, as Gail mentioned, particularly in the northern San Joaquin Valley and along the central coast. Amidst increasing incidents comes the knowledge that we are in unprecedented mega drought. Um, this report from Nature Climate Change notes that this period from um, 2000 to 2021 has been the driest 22 year period since 800 CE. And within this bigger mega drought, we've experienced um, shorter periods of more intense drought. Uh, the two periods that I want to highlight are the period between 2007 and 2009, which was a very severe drought in the state, as well as 2012 to 2015. And this latter drought was of particular historical importance because um, very high temperatures exacerbated the effects of um, low precipitation. And so there's been a lot of study um, to date about how climate affects coccidioides incidence. And different studies have come to different conclusions, in part because the effect of climate on coccidioides um, has delayed and complex nonlinear effects. And we know that climate probably affects incidence differently according to what, um, where in the life cycle of coccidioides the effect is, at, um, is um, acting. And so if we look at the, the life cycle here, um, we know that um, there are a variety of delayed effects that can happen prior to exposure. Um, there can be different effects um, that happen during the um, lysing of the mycelia and the releasing of arthrocondidia um, and the dispersion of it through wind erosion. We know um, from talks earlier that the mycelial growth requires nutrients and moisture, um, and that upstream factors like what the other communities of bacteria and fungi are in the soil matter, as well as perhaps rodent populations and vegetative populations. And so what I'll be talking about today is some studies that are seeking to clarify the effect of precipitation and temperature at each stage of the life cycle, and then also examine how the joint influences of, of precipitation and temperature that result in drought may have an effect. So I'll talk about kind of two stages of um, one larger study that has been recently published in Lancet Planetary Health. Um, the first objective is to determine how prior sequences of temperature and precipitation affect incidence um, and to look at how these effects vary by region in California. And then the second to determine the causal effect of the two historical droughts on incidents, also by region. Um, and then I'll connect these into some of our field work that's ongoing in the state. All right, so um, as I mentioned, this um, is a partnership between California Department of Public Health and UC Berkeley. And so through that partnership, we um, were able to obtain access to, can you still hear me? to the um, uh, census tract records that occurred between September and November. And we linked these census tract level cases to environmental data lagged by one through 36 months. We fit distributed lag nonlinear models um, to climate at various lags and incidents. Um, and what that produces is a nonlinear exposure response curve between a lagged climate effect and incidence. Um, so what you're seeing here is the incidence rate ratio associated with uh, changes to precipitation lagged by three months. Um, because we're modeling um, incidents in September through November here, we're able to map uh, lags onto specific periods of the year. 
So after we made um, a nonlinear curve for each of the 36 lagged months, we calculated the 75th percentile of um, that environmental condition and the 25th percentile, and we compared the incidence rate ratio at the 75th percentile to the 25th percentile, and that's what we're mapping on this plot here. And so if we look at this graph, um, just so we're all oriented, we have over here on the right-hand side our disease onset, um, which again is in the fall because that's when most of the cases of valley fever occur in the state of California. And then each of these uh, values on the x-axis is representing months prior to the estimated onset of disease. And then the y-axis is reflecting the incidence rate ratio associated with that one unit IQR um, increase in the climate effect. So if we look at the months that happened just prior to exposure, we see that um, more precipitation results in fewer cases. Um, and if we map this onto the overall life cycle diagram of coccidioides, we expect that this time period might be when the release and dispersion of arthroconidia is occurring. So this aligns with what we might expect. We also see that in the spring and the winter prior to onset, more rainfall is associated with more cases. Um, in fact, about 45% more cases. Um, and we think that this could map onto the period of mycelial growth for the fungus. If we look at the one to three years prior to disease onset, the pattern is less clear. Perhaps generally more rainfall is associated with fewer cases. Um, but what is interesting is that what happens here is actually modifying the effect of what happens in this shorter time period. So specifically, if we look at sequences of precipitation over three years, we see that the positive enhancing effect of a wet winter is enhanced by 36% if that wet winter is following two consecutive years of dry conditions. So I won't talk about temperature um, in as much detail for the sake of time, but um, this is the overall pattern, and we can see here that in the short term before exposure, uh, higher temperatures is associated with dramatically increased incidence rates. Um, so we wanted to understand how the relationship between various climate factors and incidents vary by region in California. And so we mapped county level relationships um, by uh, variables that are describing the conditions in the county. So what we're seeing here in these graphs um, is that every line represents the relationship between a environmental condition and incidence for a given county. And the counties are colored either by their mean annual, um, or sorry, mean monthly precipitation in the winter on the left or their um, mean temperature in the summer on the right. And what we noticed is that if we look just at the hotter and drier counties, um, so those counties like Kern and Kings, we see that the relationship between winter rainfall and incidence is really strong. Um, so counties like Kern and Kings, as their uh, rainfall in the winter increases, incidence rates are dramatically increased. Um, of note, we, while we see this peak here in this um, curve, the dry counties rarely receive rainfall above 60 millimeters, and so in these counties, increases in winter rainfall is almost always associated with higher increases in incidence. Um, however, the effect um, with temperature um, is much uh, less sensitive. On the other hand, if we look at those counties that are um, historically cooler and wetter, so counties along the coast and in the northern valley, we see that they're not, um, incidence is not very sensitive to variation in rainfall, but it is highly sensitive to variation in summer temperatures. Um, so to quickly summarize these findings, um, we see that in the short term, hot and dry conditions promote incidence, um, and it's the cooler counties that are especially sensitive to variation in heat. Um, however, a little bit more upstream, we see that wetter conditions in the spring and winter promote incidence as well, and it's the drier counties that are especially sensitive to fluctuations here. And then upstream, um, we see that consecutive dry years enhances the effect of a wet winter, and so this brings us to ask um, questions about, you know, how does drought play into this relationship? And so that's what I'll talk about next. Um, the objective here is to determine the causal effect of two historical droughts in California on incidence. 
Um, and so the main uh, method that I'm using is an ensemble prediction algorithm. So I built an ensemble prediction algorithm for each of the counties in the study region using the census track level data. The um, algorithm uses a variety of different statistical algorithms um, as well as machine learning models and then creates an ensemble model that has the lowest out of sample predictive error. Um, so this is what is displayed here on this graph. Um, so each of the dots is reflecting an actual observed um, the cases um, of valley fever, and then the black line is the predictive model fit to the data. Um, this is shown for Western Kern County, but in all the counties, we were able to achieve over 90% accuracy in predicting uh, county, or county level rates. So then we use an approach called a G computation, which is uh, simply a substitution estimator in which we estimated how many cases would have been observed in the absence of drought. So essentially we said take the environmental conditions during the drought and set the uh, precipitation that is lower than normal to average and set the temperature that's higher than normal to average and use the predictive model to estimate how many cases we would have observed absent the drought. And that's what this graph is showing here. So again, the black line is the predictive model based on the observed condition. And now the colored lines are the predicted incidents if the droughts had not occurred. And so what we see here is that during the 2007 to 9 and 2012 to 15 drought, we expect that we would have seen more cases had the drought not occurred. But if we look at the two years following the drought, we're actually seeing more cases than what we expect had the drought not occurred. And so we can calculate the difference between the expected um, and the observed curves to come up with the uh, total causal effect of these droughts. And what we find is that while we do estimate that the droughts averted cases in California, because of this strong increase in cases in the two years that following droughts, um, there is actually a net increase in cases um, due to droughts in California. So we then looked at the effect of these changes across the different counties in California, where we split some of the counties that um, have very different uh, temperature and precipitation regimes by uh, elevation isoclines. So we're splitting Kern here, as you can see, in some of the other counties. Um, and what we find is that during drought, the, the strongest declines were seen in these drier counties like Kern. Um, however, after the drought, we're seeing the largest relative increases um, in the northern San Joaquin counties and also in the coastal counties, as Gail mentioned. And so if we calculate the cumulative number of cases that are either caused or averted by drought, we see that in all counties except the western part of Kern, there was a cumulative increase in cases associated with drought, um, whereas in western Kern we see a net decrease in cases. Um, and so I wanted to relate these findings to the small mammal endozoan hypothesis um, because I knew that Dr. Taylor would be talking about it and it also um, relates to really exciting work that's happening um, from our group at Berkeley. Um, and so another kind of pattern that we see that's associated with drought is fluctuations in rodent populations. During drought, we see massive die-offs of rodent populations, um, but following the drought, we see massive rebounds in rodent populations. And this is kind of similar to what we see for coxie incidents. And so briefly, I'll share some preliminary results of a study that we have ongoing in which we're really seeking to understand what is the role of the rodent on coccidioides in the soil and what is the role of the burrow. Um, Dr. Taylor and others from this, uh, from this group will present a lot about the association that has been found between burrows and presence of coccidioides in the soil. And one thing that has kind of stymied researchers is the ability to disentangle the rodent from the burrow. And so that um, kind of leads to a project that we have now in the Carrizo Plain called the Carrizo Plain Ecology Project. Um, the Carrizo Plain is the largest intact grassland in California. Um, and in 2007, there was a group of researchers that were studying the endangered kangaroo rat. And so they set up rodent exclosures that have excluded rodents from certain areas. And so what that leaves us with is an ecosystem where we have a lot of burrows, and we also have burrows that have been abandoned since 2007. So you can see here um, that the Carrizo Plain is located in San Luis Obispo. It's an area of very high endemicity for California, um, and there are numerous outbreaks that have happened in the Carrizo Plain for coxie. 
Um, this is an aerial view of one of the experimental plots. You can see in the middle here, there's a smaller square. That's where the rodent exclosure fence was built. It's a chicken wire fence that's built a meter deep um, to exclude rodents from burrowing under. Um, as I mentioned, the main rodent um, in this ecosystem is the endangered kangaroo rat, um, although in this area it's very populous and they make these rodent precincts that are like these small mounds. And so we've been sampling seasonally across a factorial design that crosses burrows and surface soils with rodents and rodent exclosures. Um, and these are some of our preliminary results. Um, to date, we have analyzed 1,489 samples in the laboratory, and we found coccidioides um, DNA in 17% of these samples. We see that in the burrows that do have rodents, over 30% of the soils have coccidioides, um, but this drops to about 18% uh, when we look at burrows that do not have rodents, so those burrows that are contained within the exclosure. We have found coccidioides in the surface soils, but at much lower rates. Um, and there's no statistically significant difference between the surface soils that have rodents running around and the rodents that don't have rodents running around. Um, just to um, summarize again, um, uh, how this presentation updates our understanding of the role of climate in coxie epidemiology. Um, we discovered that drought displaces and then amplifies incidence. Um, we know that incidence is increasing most rapidly in some of the wetter and cooler counties, and we show evidence that the incidence in these counties is very sensitive to changes in temperature, um, and also the increase in incidence is highest following the drought in these counties. Um, we know from various climate models that the frequency and severity of drought is expecting to increase, as well as there will, um, there's expected to be greater swings from both aridity to then uh, straw heavy rainfall. And so these sorts of swinging patterns might lead to increases in incidence in the state, especially in wetter and cooler areas, um, whereas some of these drier areas might actually see a decrease in cases um, if it becomes too arid for coxie. Um, and then lastly, I'll note that the role of climate and rodent populations on coccidioides may be interrelated and yet to be teased out fully. So, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really cool. I, yeah, I'm excited to see where, the, where that study goes.